following is a production of Cary TV, the town of Cary's government access channel. Good evening and welcome to the April 11th, 2013 Cary Planning and Development Committee meeting. Uh, to my left is Mayor Pro Tem Gail Adcock, to my right Councilman Ed Yurha, and to his right Town Manager Ben Shiver, and I'm Don France. Uh, we have one item on the consent agenda for this evening. It is consideration of the fiscal year 2014 Community Development Block Grant Annual Action Plan. Would any councilors care to pull it off the agenda or I some comments? Just make a comment. Please. Uh, certainly not going to pull it. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. But at the last uh, public hearing, we had several representatives um, from the recipients of these grants or the designated recipients of these grants come and thank us for all that uh, we do for them. I just thought it might be appropriate at this time uh, to thank them for all they do for the town of Cary. Uh, we're proud to have them as, as part of the fabric of Cary and um, really look forward to this, these grants being distributed. And thank you, Tracy, for, for coordinating all of this. Thank you very much, Mr. Yara. Uh, all right, first up for discussion, and our only item for discussion is the architectural standards clarification, and we'll hear from Mr. Kevin Hales. Good evening. As you mentioned, it's a request to clarify some of the architectural design standards. As council is aware, we uh, adopted our architectural design standards in 2005 and have been implementing those over the years. Uh, we have certain items that we have consistent questions on, and that's what we're here to get some clarification and, and maybe clean up the document to make it a little easier in the future. Uh, three big things. Uh, the first is applicability of individual facades of a building. We came in 2008 to get a little clarification and have been implementing uh, direction we got at that time that any facade that is reasonably expected to be visible to the public, which of course has very broad wording. Looking to clean it up a little bit further and clarify from where it is publicly visible. And then also take into account some changes that have been made to our buffer standard since 2008 to increase the opacity uh, height requirement in a type A buffer from six feet to 18 feet, which would of course hide more of a building. So staff's recommendation there would be to clarify that it's publicly visible, a facade subject, if it is publicly visible from a street travel way or other vehicular conveyance, it could be an alley or whatever else, and that if it is behind a 40 foot or larger type A buffer, it would not be subject. So that would, if uh, there are instances around town where there are buildings back up to a, a 40 foot type A buffer and on the other side of that type A buffer, there's another building. Uh, so there's no vehicular travel way or anything back there. Does it really make sense? And is there a lot of, a lot of benefit to the public gained by requiring the applicant to put masonry and, and a lot of articulation on the back of a building that no one's ever gonna see except the, the HVAC repairman. Second option, 
Um, our second thing we're looking for clarification is the requirements for transparency on restaurants. Right now, the way the wording is, is that it's ground level of retail uses is 50%, and then office and other commercials are 35%. Staff has consistently been treating uh, restaurants as a 50% requirement because it has a very similar pedestrian interaction to its typical retail. Uh, a lot of restaurants, especially in shopping centers, you're walking by, you stop in, you see people eating. Uh, so we think it makes sense to provide 50% transparency there as well. This is really just a clarification, not changing anything we're doing, uh, just to make it clearer for when applicants come in. The last thing we're looking for clarification on or, or a change to the, the way the standards are written would be the requirement for a base under uh, Windows. Uh, when we originally adopted these back in 2005, we were looking at a masonry base, 18 to 24 inches underneath all windows. We've since done some internal interpretation to say that it doesn't have to be a masonry base, but it still creates issues, especially in shopping centers where you have a lot of tenant turnover and you're constantly revising how that storefront works, taking in a door, putting in double doors instead of a single door. When you have a base, especially a masonry base, it's a much more expensive and, and convoluted effort to, to make those storefront changes every time a tenant switches out. So this really would provide more flexibility, especially in retail tenants. It also clarifies some stuff when you have an office building that wants to do a curtain wall system, which a lot of modern office buildings have glazing that go all the way down to the ground. This would clarify that that's allowed. There have been instances we've allowed that where visibility has been limited, but it's kind of in contravention of the current wording. So we just want to clarify that. So if you have any questions, we'll be here and staff's recommendations are as I laid out. Thank you. Outstanding. Uh, questions, comments, Mr. Yerha? Um, sure. As, as far as the restaurants and the glazing base go, mm -hmm. I'm with you 100%. Um, as far as the facades, when you have the three options, um, we're looking primarily for clarification. Option one doesn't seem to clarify anything, so in my uh, opinion... Option one is what we're currently doing. <laughs> that, 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 that's, we need to change that. Um, option two and option three, at this point I'm leaning toward option two. Uh, in, instead of three. I think both of them provide clarification. I think option three adds, as I think you've indicated here, some interpretation to it. And I know I wasn't around at the, uh, wasn't part of the conversation when this whole thing came up originally when this, mm -hmm. this was put in place. So I'm not necessarily sure what the interpretation of the council at that time was. Um, but based on a number of things, one of which you mentioned here, the vegetation within a type A buffer may not grow to a height to screen the entire building or, or could take a generation maybe to do, to do so. Um, I'm leaning toward, toward option two. It's not a showstopper for me. Uh, if, if it turns out that the interpretation really was, you know, that option three fits that a little bit better, but um, I'm leaning toward two. Keep the clarification, but not the inter change the interpretation. Well, first of all, I appreciate the staff always trying to make our ordinances uh, more clear so that there's a lot less variability in how you apply them. I think the development community certainly appreciates that as well as, as do we, um, so that you don't have to make so many judgment calls. So I appreciate you're doing that just uh, on the front end. Um, as along with Mr. Yurha, your um, your second two issues, I have no no conflict with at all. The transparency and um, for number, revising the transparency percentage for number two and the final paragraph of the transparency requirements for number three are, are non-controversial as far as I'm concerned. Um, as far as number one goes, I actually lean towards um, option three. I, I am concerned about the the 40 foot uh, opaque type A buffer if it doesn't grow to the, um, to the anticipated height, but Kevin, help me with something. When we have a, um, a type A buffer in residential and we say okay, it has to be, have certain plantings and everything, what happens if it doesn't grow to the anticipated height in those situations? There's a reasonable maturation period which we allow them to grow. And, and with the new type A buffer standard at 18 feet, it's no longer three to five years. When it was six feet, we, and we still expect a, opacity of six to feet, six feet within three to five years. Right. Um, if the buffer fails to, to meet that performance standard, then we would go back and require additional plant material or replacement plant material, sometimes larger. It just depends on, on the situation. Um, and I know we've done that recently down um, on Davis Drive that we had a, uh, I guess I'd call it a buffer failure. We, we have fixed the Searstone buffer. Had to go in, right, had to go yep. in and do replantings. It was a, it was a couple, it was actually the, um, 
the recreation facility, the, the cheer area. I can't think of what the name of it is. Uh, Carolina uh, Legacy. Yes, thank you, Carolina Legacy. I think it was there before actually they kept failing and because of the time it was planted. So I think we have ways to address that. Tell me how that would be different than um, option three if we were to choose that. Um, the, the difference really between option two and option three, option two takes into account nothing about topography or the buffer. It basically says that if, if I'm standing on a road and there's a hill or whatever and I can see the back of the building, it's subject. <coughs> there are situations where you could end up with a type A buffer at the bottom of a hill and you'd be looking over it and you'd see the back of the building in option three and it would not be subject because it is behind a type 40 foot type A buffer. And so if we chose option three, you would have to approve that or that would have to, that would pass, if you will, even if that buffer's at the bottom of the hill and the, okay. We Correct. Just, it, it provides the most, <laughs> it provides the most clarity, but right, also but the most opportunity for more sight, for, more okay. well, that, visibility. Yeah, that troubles me. Now, if you had option two, um, you get more flexibility, more clarity, more uh, consistency in application, but you're not going to get caught in a catch-22. It sounds like you would with option three with where the buffer's located based on topography. Correct, and we, we, and that's we, not we we've tried to massage this. It's wiggle room, right? Yeah, there, there's, it's very difficult to write if the buffer's no more than 10 foot below or 10 foot above. Right. I mean, there's so many variables there, it's, it's very difficult to write a So it's a slippery a slope off. if we didn't, right. no pun intended. Mm. Slippery <laughs> slope if we do that. Well, that's very helpful because that certainly makes me look more favorably on option two. A uh, question I have would be how much concern, complaints, feedback are we getting from the development building community on this particular issue? On the applicability? It's mm -hmm. one, probably one of our bigger questions because they don't want to put any more then masonry on a facade than they have to. It's, it is a cost mm -hmm. issue, constructability. I mean, gotcha. Um, okay. Follow up question. Please. Good. So by, if we were to, to recommend option two then, would you uh, anticipate that maybe 50% of the issues that you're having to do with case by case would be addressed with this or more? It would take care of a majority of the, of the issues that come up that then have to be dealt with on case by case and use subjectivity? It's hard to give a number to that. But um, just I, well, then qualify it rather than quantify it. it it's going to take care of the issues where there are discussions or negotiations about where is a public greenway back there? Is it publicly visible? Oh, I see. Um, it clarifies publicly visible from where, so it narrows the scope of when the applicant's driving around their site and siting their building and designing, figuring out what they need to do, they say, okay, I'm gonna drive on all the roads that are surrounding it and on my internal travelways, is it gonna be visible versus it's visible from a quarter mile up the road, main road goes up a hill. Okay. So it's, it will um, give the staff firmer ground to stand on and not have to negotiate these. Correct, but it's still situations. gonna require more masonry buildings or oh, backs of buildings than number three. I don't think that's a problem for us. <laughs> Right. right. Um, I actually support option two. To me, at the end of the day, we're trying to ensure that all development and carry is quality development. Um, I don't really care too much about square footage, densities, that kind of thing, as long as we're getting quality. And I think option two ensures that we get quality. Um, it removes the argument about the buffer. Or, where can you see it from topography, those kinds of things. It just ensures that we get a top-notch building when it's built. Okay. Um, if that means that we have to you know, give a little square footage or give a few extra units to make it economically viable for them, then so be it. But uh, at the end of the day, I want quality, and I think number two does that. So you like number two? I can go with two. Sounds like we're unanimous for number two. Number two. All right. Um, you could make a lot of jokes right there. <laughs> Well, <laughs> <laughs> all right, uh, seeing no other business before us, we are adjourned. Thank you all very much.
This has been a production of Cary TV. Visit the Town of Cary's website at townofcary.org.